Teresa doesn't seem like that at all, and by all accounts, she was safe. She she wasn't a high risk victim at all. So why did she become a victim? That's what we have to look at. So through her victimology, she was raised in a <clears throat> in a tough environment with siblings um, that were older than her, but. She integrated well into whatever community she was in. Um, she was not easily intimidated. I'm reading here uh, from a quote from the victimology form that I had them, the family fill out. Uh, she wasn't fearful of falling victim to any type of violent crime. Teresa's family once lived in a predominantly African-American community in the Boston area and then moved to Bellingham. Um... She had a false sense of security because of this. But Bellingham is a small royal town as compared to the area in Boston where they used to live. Uh, Teresa's professional goal was to be a pediatrician. Um, she was enrolled at classes at Holliston Junior College to become a medical assistant. And she had only lived in Bellingham a couple years prior to her death. So... When I look at this victimology form, okay, first off, why, why have somebody fill out that form? Again, you want to know that victim. And I gave many examples of this, so I don't want to rehash it. But <clears throat> it gives you an insight as to what they will do during a given situation. It also tells you, you can start deducing things, maybe not 100%, but... You know, you can you can certainly deduce from possibility to probabilities based strictly on victimology. Now here's an example in this case. So I'm going to read right from my report, you know, what I deduced straight from victimology. So this is my victimology assessment. So what about Teresa's victimology help us, us get closer to solving her murder? We can deduce a number of things just from victimology. Okay, so number one, she would speak to strangers, which leads to her vulnerability to be coaxed into a vehicle of possible abduction. Okay, she was trusting. We can deduce this because of her outgoing nature and the fact she hitchhiked often. She was tough. She believed nothing bad would happen to her, especially as it related to her walking and hitchhiking. She was not a heavy drinker. She did smoke marijuana, but that was the extent of her drug use, and it wasn't extensive. Her small body weight and height, 5'4", 120, would have an effect on her intoxication level when drinking. See, these things you learn from victimology as well, and they play a key role in deducing what happened. Number five, her sexual history indicates only two known partners. If this is true, the account of consensual sex that we're going to encounter later at the presidential arms with multiple partners can be called into question. She was attractive in good physical shape and she walked a lot. She may have been a victim of a past sexual assault by a neighbor. That's not confirmed. And she had a good if not great relationship with her family and her mother and would call home if in trouble now that's that's eight items that we deduced just from her victimology alone do you see how this now can play into the unfolding of this case as we go forward so from that victimology let's jump right to the timeline let's jump to and I want to be specific on this timeline, like I told you that I would be. So, 
on December 4th, 1978, between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m., Teresa goes to work, and she works at a place called Penthouse Sales. I talked about that earlier in the week. She says that she's going to a party later. Nothing unusual, you know. She's in college. She's 19. You know, okay. Now, at some point before going to the bar, she is drinking at a person's house whose name's Jimmy at his apartment. So her intoxication level is starting to, to go. At 10.30... So, between 7 and 10.30, within that time frame, she's already drinking. At 10.30, she arrives at the train stop bar. She's there to celebrate a friend's birthday. This was planned. She's there for an hour till about 11.30. Her boyfriend is there with her. her. His name is Rick. They get into an argument. Now, what is that argument about? Um... He is seen talking to one of his ex-girlfriends there, supposedly, and there were some jealousy issues there. You know, just like any typical young relationship. Nothing out of the ordinary. But she leaves that bar. Now, this is where some discrepancy comes in, and this is where it hurts not having the police reports. Because I think the police reports would have this fact that we should know. So we don't know whether she hitchhikes or she's or she's given a ride. I tend to believe she's given a ride um, to the Academy Arms apartment building. There's documentation that she's picked up by a gentleman named Ronnie. His name is going to be important in this. So remember Ronnie. His brother or relation, I believe it's a brother, Donnie. A gentleman possibly named Michael and another individual so you might have three or four individuals in this car that pick her up she knows at least one of the people in the car or she, more than likely she wouldn't have got in but her victimology says maybe she would because she hitchhiked but she's she's intoxicated at this point by all I, I can't say that because I have no I have no documentation, no statements of that at this point. I'm just going by since she's been drinking since seven o'clock, seven thirty, and now it's eleven thirty. And she wasn't a heavy drinker. She's picked up in front of the Dairy Queen that's located at twenty one North Main Street. Okay. That's gonna be important too. Regardless of how she gets there, she gets to this party. She's told there's a party at this Presidential Arms apartment building. She is there from, let's let's just say, 11.45 p.m. to 4 in the morning. Big gap of time, right? Between 4 and 4.30, she leaves the apartment building. Now, there is a discrepancy as to why she leaves. It is suggested that she is angry that a possible sexual assault or a sexual assault attempt is occurring or had occurred. But we don't, we don't know for sure. But what we do know is when she departs, she leaves that apartment with mismatched shoes. One male shoe and one of her own shoe. Now see, this is something that had to be worked backwards from when the body is discovered. It's not that simple. The body is discovered, and if you find two different types of shoes, well, you're thinking, well, what's going on? Well, they worked it backwards, and this is where it came from, that apartment building. Now why? Well, I surmised at the time that it could be, and probably is because of her intoxication level, her haste to leave if she was in a hurry running to get out of there or simply because it was dark or a combination of all three which it probably was but it's approximately a four hour window there that's a long time to be a, at a party that you don't want to be at right 
So between four and five, now that she has left that apartment building, that party, where it was all guys, she's observed sitting on a guardrail between 4 and 5 a.m. on Route 140, and she's picked up by a Garlic Farms truck driver. He drives her to the entrance of his employer, which is at 1199 West Central Street in Franklin, Massachusetts. He drops her off there. She's then picked up by a second Garlic Farms driver who drops her off in front of the police station at the intersection of Route 140 and Route 126. They say she's cold. They say she's intoxicated. That's 5 o'clock. She's dropped off in front of the police station. She makes no mention of reporting a sexual assault to the police or anything, but this is where they drop her off. Now, why there? Why it w- were... Because she only lived another half mile up. So why did they take her there? Is it because the truck driver was not going another half mile? Was that out of his way? That's something that I think I would want to know, and I don't think I ever got an answer to that. But at 5.30 a.m., 30 minutes now, probably after she was dropped off, Teresa's observed by three men carpooling to work at the General Motors plant. She's walking past the Dairy Queen, same Dairy Queen that she was picked up in front of, walking towards Hartford Avenue. This is the last known sighting of Teresa alive. This is on December 5th. December 8th, three days later at 4.30 p.m., a call is placed to the police station about a body being located. The caller identified himself as John Burlington from Connecticut. Police get there. Teresa's body is recovered in a gully off of the northbound lane of Interstate 495. Okay, this John Burlington is going to be a key figure as well as we move forward here. So, now let's talk about the body location. I won't fear of sin. 